OK. OK, we are back on track after the, the coffee. Uh, now we have an uh, industrial talk by uh, Enrico Mercadante uh, from uh, Cisco Italy. He's responsible for the uh, innovation for Cisco. Thanks also for being here. Okay. So, can you hear me well? No? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So, um, yeah, as, uh, just a brief uh, intro of myself. Uh, I'm uh, an engineer, studied in Rome. Uh, and I'm working for Cisco since uh, now 16 years, so quite a while. Before that, uh, working for Ericsson, and before that, uh, uh, in a research consortium in, uh, in Rome, was doing research about um, ATM switches. A little bit old stuff now, <laughs> ATM switches. Um, and uh, I'm uh, uh, leading the initiative for innovation of Cisco Italy. Um, uh, and I explain you a little bit what, what we are doing, and also uh, sales, uh, platform sales, so sales of our innovative platform. So uh, my main job is selling stuff to customers, and uh, I think you know Cisco, so, and uh, our market is mainly B2B, so uh, selling to uh, businesses and uh, public administration, basically. So today, uh, I'll give you a little bit uh, uh, a different perspective, uh, quite focused uh, initially on Italy. Um, and uh, the perspective is about uh, accelerating digital transformation. You know, you have seen lots of slides probably lately about uh, IoT, 50 billion device, trillion of things, everything connected. Uh, that's the potential. So what's actually happening and what are we doing uh, in order to accelerate this. Uh, every, every country basically is now working on digital transformation of the public sector, of critical infrastructures, uh, and of the businesses, of the actual enterprises. Why? Because uh, basically is a competitive advantage towards other countries, okay? Uh, and so there are several programs in, f in place in France, in UK, in Germany, and also in Italy in order to get things faster. Uh, so what we had, uh, have done uh, as uh, a Cisco is to launch two years ago a program, uh, we call it uh, Digitaliani, uh, so it, Digital Italians, <laughs> uh, in order to uh, have some investment. So there are $100 million on the table uh, in three years, so we are now starting the third year, uh, of, of investments uh, in order to give our contribution to the acceleration of digital transformation in Italy. So where are we spending and investing this money? Uh, you see the six, let's say, main areas here. So one is about digitizing infrastructure. This is a super important topic. If you are uh, studying networks and security networks, that's the topic. So how do I secure and how do I build a smart grid? How do I connect oil pipes? How do I connect critical infrastructure like roads, smart roads, uh, smart roads, sorry, uh, trains and stuff like that, okay? So there is a lot of money, a lot of tenders today. So this is happening today. Uh, uh, so there, there are investment in networks and in cybersecurity on that, okay? And this is, you, you bet, this is very critical as a strategic asset because if you have digital infrastructure, it's good because uh, you, you can do new things, you know, you can offer new services to, uh, to the people in the country. However, it's uh, also very risky, right? Because you connect basically the core of the, of the nation to the internet, more or less, right? You don't really plug it, but it's more accessible. So the attacks are more frequent. We are, we are seeing attacks all over the place. So this is a very interesting research field. And, and I show you also a little bit what we, will, we are doing. Um, the other uh, two things uh, um, are digitizing the businesses, the enterprise, so every um, Every company basically is getting digital. We are working a lot with manufacturing companies. Okay, so the manufacturing companies are very interested in going in the in the shop floor, so where they have the big machines. Uh, I don't know, 
building staff from automakers uh, to makers of machines. So in it Italy is uh, the sec second manufacturing country in Europe and uh, we are first in terms of machine builders. So we build machines that then are used, then are used to build other machines, right? And uh, 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 being a worldwide leader in that, uh, uh, it's very interesting the, the, the digital transformation there because instead of selling machines, you could connect these machines and selling a service out of the machine, right? Because you, you connect the machine and instead of selling a uh, seven million uh, uh, um, euros worth machine, let's say to make packets of cigarettes, just to make you an example, you know the, the, the machines that are making packets of cigarettes. It's a pretty sophisticated stuff because they have to go quick and, uh, and, and very, very lean in operation. And instead of selling a big machine like that to your customer, you could uh, sell a service and you say, okay, pay me $1 per packet or whatever it is, uh, probably one cent per packet. Um, and this is a change in business model and a change in profitability. And a lot of these machine builders are, are thinking how, how they can use digital to make this kind of new business. Okay, so there is a big transformation in manufacturing, huge. Uh, in parallel, a little bit slower, uh, Italy is very well known for, uh, for his agri-food sector. I think uh, probably one billion people worldwide uh, eat something Italian during one year. So the <laughs> the we have a pretty big brand. So digital applied to agri-food is very interesting uh, if you think about uh, food safety. So how do I track back if uh, I have a problem with some, uh, some product, some food product? Uh, and also uh, track the origin of food and how is it processed in order to sell it as a little bit higher price, right? And guarantee to the consumer that is coming from a particular uh, place uh, and it's really original, blah, blah, blah. So agri-food is also digitizing uh, a little bit less fast than manufacturing, but uh, is, is ongoing there. Uh, the other investment we are doing in uh, digital public services uh, we could call it smart cities and smart serv services. Uh, in reality, smart cities is becoming some, in, some utopic, if you want, concept now. Uh, because uh, at the end, what it matters to the, to the citizen or to the tourist is the service, not having a smart cities. I want a, a service that is helping me to find, I don't know, the right shops or it's helping me to find the right transportation around the uh, three, four different uh, transportation, uh, um, uh, let's say, means in the city and so on. So this is another area of, uh, of investment. Uh, and then there are two uh, interesting fields which uh, also are the ones I, I, I will uh, dig a little bit more into, which is education and innovation, okay? So education is pretty uh, important for a country, uh, you bet. And what we are doing is trying, uh, starting from, uh, let's say, young people like uh, 15 years to 20 years, but also a little bit above, uh, to uh, help the country in having more uh, digital knowledge. What I mean, when uh, I'm gonna um, study, not a university, not like you, right, but I'm gonna study to be a, um, uh, a simple man in a, in a manufacturing plant, right, doing, doing a very simple job. Now that everything is digitizing, I have to have a little bit of basic of digital stuff, how, how, how do I cope with, uh, with a machine that is programmable and so on. Uh, and so we, and, and if I'm a farmer and all this digital stuff is getting in my farm, I have to understand a little bit of that. So we are working on a basic, uh, um, and I will tell a little bit about it, on a basic digital knowledge. And also basic cybersecurity knowledge, because uh, cybersecurity, you know it better than me, uh, you are the expert, is about technical stuff, but it's mostly about culture. Okay, so the most attacks and leaks in a company happen because of misbehavior of people, okay, which, which means poor cybersecurity culture. So likewise, when you cross the street, right, you look left and right in order, because you were, you were taught to, to do this when you were a child, 
uh, when you connect something to the internet or you open the PC and connect to some website, you should have the basic culture, basically understand what's going on and if I'm doing the right thing. And this is not there uh, currently in the vast majority of the people in, in every country and in Italy as well, okay? Uh, the other part where we are investing is uh, uh, innovation, so working uh, um, with startups, with uh, um, university and researchers uh, to basically help, since we are not the research part of Cisco, uh, uh, we are the sales part of Cisco, so our objective is to do co-innovation with our customers, so work with universities, with startups, accelerators and so on, with the ultimate goal to do innovative projects, applied uh, innovation and research directly with our customers on this topic of digital transformation. And mainly our main focus now is digital public sec uh, services and, um, and the digital enterprise in manufacturing in particular. Uh, we are doing a, a number of things there. Okay, uh, feel free to interrupt me if there are, uh, if there are questions. Huh? So what we, in, in order to do this innovation thing that I was explaining, uh, uh, what we are doing is we, we created a basically a distributed innovation center. So the choice of Cisco in Italy was let's not build a big building with the Cisco sign and say, okay, let's call all the cool innovators in Italy on, who want to work with us and, and, and come in our house and do something clever. Is no, let's spend uh, and invest the resources where innovation is already happening and help who is doing innovation to connect with customers mm, and to do actual projects so, so that they work with real challenge on the real market and we speed up this technology transfer from universities, from uh, uh, young startups uh, to the market. Okay, so this is the ultimate, uh, um, the ultimate goal. So we put resources in place, we put our platform where, where, they, uh, where they are needed and try to connect things. Uh, and at the end, what we are um, trying to do is, uh, as I said, co-innovation project with customers, okay? So I'll make you an example. Um, uh, what we did lately, we, we lately with three, four manufacturing companies is, uh, um, have uh, um, some fog computing application. Do you know what's fog computing? Yes, yes. Okay, more or less. So fog computing is basically running applications in the network, at the edge of the network, okay? And that's particularly interesting in industrial application because uh, if you have, uh, um, let's say, a, a manufacturing plant with all the machines and you wanna connect these machines in order to get the data from the machines, right? That's cool because I can do predictive maintenance, I can do a number of things there. Um, but if I take this di data and put it on the cloud, uh, the, the lag is, is pretty long, okay? So if I have to take quick decision, it's, uh, the turnaround is, is too long. Okay, so there are some functions which make sense to have locally, okay? Think about security stuff. If I see something like my machine, industrial machine is kind of exploding, I wanna shut it down immediately, okay? So I need to take the sh decision there. And so um, what we are working with, we are working with uh, a pretty cool uh, uh, Italian startup coming from the University of Pisa, uh, in uh, they are doing a kind of a universal translator of industrial protocol to um, more standard protocols like MQTT uh, in order to connect all variety of machines, right? Uh, that's, a, that's an example. And obviously then you have to build all the security features, so network segmentation and firewalling uh, uh, inside um, and, and also threat detection inside, inside the network plant. Uh, and, and this is an example that we are replicating uh, uh, across many customers. So there is a need now to connect everything that uh, is in an industrial machine to basically a local network. And the security implications are huge. So this is a very interesting field of, uh, of uh, research and uh, applied research, I would say. Okay, just to make you an example. Uh, so basically this distributed in innovation center is done <laughs> like this. So we are picking and choosing some specific initiative. I will not go through it, but just to um, show you 
we have some specific, specific initiatives ongoing uh, all over the place. And then um, also I hope uh, we will have uh, a nice initiative here also with the competence center of industry 4.0. Um, you, you see the left in Pordenone up there, uh, which is actually a lab uh, uh, where, um, where we are putting an open lab for manufacturing digitization basically with McKinsey and this will be part of the digital innovation hub. Um, okay, so that's the concept of distributed innovation center. Um, let me skip this. Um, so also we are trying to industrialize a little bit this co-innovation proce process. So um, we believe that uh, if uh, many companies uh, have uh, initiatives around open innovation, which means take an opportunity to for digitization, so a problem, okay? Usually a digi digitization pro problem is either three things. Either you want to make more money thanks to data, either you want to save money thanks to data and connecting stuff, or you want to reduce risk. So these are the three things that at the end ultimately digitization bring. Uh, so the companies should start, we are, we are, let's say, looking to our customer to start thinking that way. And then instead of trying to solve themselves, to open up to the community, again, to start up university and so on, and we want to help them to connect with, to this ecosystem in order then to uh, get to a proof of concept, okay, and a pilot of this solution and then iterate on that. So this is basically what is our job today in order to accelerate innovation. Uh, also, we are building up uh, a community in Italy around uh, uh, developers on uh, network platforms because you know what is also happening in networks now is uh, uh, they are getting programmable, which is pretty cool, okay? So you can uh, uh, now uh, reason, program uh, a network not only in theory, but also in practice. So you can uh, go to a large, um, again, manufacturing plant or a large mall or airport, and, and you can dynamically adjust the network, not by configuring stuff, but by having applications speaking directly through the controller to the network, so the SDN concept. Uh, and this is getting real, which means all the developers uh, that uh, are around uh, uh, should start to think, okay, I'm not only developing, um, I don't know, Java code for um, taking some cool uh, uh, cloud features from the Google Cloud or from, from the Amazon Cloud and making some cool app, uh, but also this cool app could start to speak with a, with a network and request a service, a service from the network and get some security feature from the network in a dynamic way, okay? So, uh, and so programmers need also to know networking and how to program network. And uh, that's pretty new and pretty cool, and so we are starting a little bit of evangelization uh, on that, okay? If you are interested, we have a, a site for developers dedicated to Italy, which is this one. Uh, I was speaking about education, just to um, wrap up on that, on basic education. Uh, what we are doing is uh, in the last 24 months, so two years, we already trained 100,000 students. And, uh, and um, by the way, uh, 5,000, no, almost 10% of them, 7,000 now, but it will be uh, 10,000 soon also took a class on, on cybersecurity, okay? Which is very, very interesting uh, because there is a lot of interest now in the young people to, to study cybersecurity. Also, in collaboration with a number of universities, we sponsored an initiative course called Cyber Challenge, which is uh, focused at people probably at your age, uh, so 19 to 22, 23, uh, about having an accelerated course on cybersecurity during the weekends, uh, where us and al other, let's say, IBM and other, let's say, uh, big companies are, and obviously the professors are doing lectures, oops, uh, <laughs> are doing lectures, 
uh, and we try to, uh, let's say, teach the cyber defenders of the future, okay? And I hope this year we will have probably 150 people. Last year we did a pilot, it were 27. Now uh, we'll have 150 young, young uh, person trained on that, which is very interesting because is there is a huge skill shortage in the country on cybersecurity skills. Uh, another initiative uh, that I did, let me see how we're doing with time. Yeah. Another initiative that we did is, uh, um, is called Filiera Sicura, which is secure supply chain uh, in Italian. And um, we did it, uh, uh, this is a sponsor research from, from Cisco, okay? Uh, and Leonardo, which is a, a, a local company that you may know, Film Meccanica. And uh, it's a very interesting topic, which is, okay, I have a supply chain, whatever is the supply chain. It would, can be food, it can be, again, manufacturing, whatever. It can be a bank, because you can think a bank also as a supply chain, if you want, or insurance. And uh, if I'm digitizing the supply chain, which are the cybersecurity implications of digitizing a complex supply chain? Hmm? There are some uh, interesting cyber, uh, sorry, supply chain attacks that happen lately. Uh, I don't know if you heard about supply chain attacks. Probably yes. So, for instance, if I have, I'm a company, and I'm trusting a software provider, right? And the software provider then, uh, at a certain point, gets attacked, and his software update can leak malware to me. So I'm trusting my supplier, which is the software, is a serious company. <laughs> but eventually, if he's the weakest link and he gets attacked successfully, I can get attacked because I'm trusting him. So this kind of supply chain attack uh, will be more and more um, important and relevant because at the end, in order to do business in a quick way, you have to trust people. And so people is in general is trusting the B2B relationship. But in a B2B rela a relationship that is complex and digitized, it's very easy to take the weakest link and attack the big guy through the weakest link. Okay, and this is happening. So in order to prevent that, we are sponsoring this, this research that is uh, divided in seven working package. Um, and it's main, mainly about uh, product life cycle, software, uh, hardening software, hardening uh, um, hardware, securing, for instance, this, this fog application, these applications that are going around the network. So there are a number of interesting topics that we are uh, addressing with, with this security, uh, with this research, okay? So, um, any question until now? I'm gonna dig now in some, see? Okay, uh, I'm repeating the question just, uh, just, <laughs> just in case. So uh, the question, which is a very relevant and interesting one, is in uh, uh, digitizing, so introducing networks in a industrial uh, scenario or whatever operational scenario that is a traditional operation, you have a lot of legacy systems, legacy protocols uh, uh, that in some way you have to, to deal with, right? So how you deal with that? Um, the approach is very similar to what happened 25 years ago, 20 years, 25 years ago, when there were a lot of different LAN protocols. Uh, you remember, maybe you don't remember, but there were token ring and uh, IBM had his own protocol and everybody had his own protocol. Then at a certain point, it came the router and it came IP. And the approach there was 
we cannot cope with everything, let's make everything over IP. <laughs> and let's just initially tunnel it, right? And then eventually the, the world went on and uh, started to appear na native IP endpoints and eventually all this translation uh, is going away, right? Also I ATM, I mean, how many ATM frames are still transported over IP networks? Huge number, right? Um, so this is basically what I see happening. So what I see happening is at the edge, you do some kind of translation, uh, encapsulation. Uh, and I was uh, uh, mentioning this, uh, this startup we are working with on industrial protocols. So what they are doing is exactly that. So um, since also uh, who is producing industrial machine is not always very happy to give you how the protocol is done. And uh, so maybe the protocol, yes, but not the driver. No, when I mean how is the field, the mapping of the fields done, which, which needs basically a driver. So in order to translate all this mess, for instance, in a manufacturing environment to MQTT, which is one of the most, let's say, standard, uh, uh, standardly used or widely used, um, you have to have this kind of translation. So these, guy, these guys uh, uh, are pretty clever and they invented some very lean way to build drivers for whatever machine, right? And they have now 5,000 of them. And it can be that in the world there are 100,000 kind of machines because also different releases and so on. So it will not be uh, very um, uh, simple to deal with that. Uh, however, this is the, let's say, the basic uh, way we are doing it. So translation at the edge, encapsulation when, when you have to bring it from one way to the other and try not to deal too much with, uh, because these industrial machine are even worse than the problem I was, uh, the similarity I was having before, uh, because have a long uh, uh, living time. So an industrial machine can be there for 15 years. So, and, and it's a too big investment to change it just because the protocol is not the right stuff. You, so you have to, mm, uh, how you say, retrofit everything, basically. is a retrofitting uh, uh, strategy. Did it answer your question? Okay. Good. Let me check time. Ten minutes. So, um, in ten minutes, uh, uh, let me go very quickly on a couple. Now I'm uh, changing a little bit gears and go to cybersecurity, okay? Always from, let's say, more a market perspective. So cybersecurity and networks, basically. Uh, so what's the issue today of customers? I'm not speaking about technical issues, but customer issue on cybersecurity is basically three. One is compliance. I want to be compliant with the Italian cybersecurity framework, with the NIST um, framework, whatever it is. Uh, we have also GDPR that has some serious implication on cybersecurity, obviously. So uh, and this will evolve, okay? So companies are thinking, oh my God, I have to be compliant to whatever. That's number one uh, thing that they are thinking. Secondly, you know it better than me, in cybersecurity, today you are okay, tomorrow you are in deep trouble, right? Because things are evolving pretty, pretty fast. Uh, and thirdly, is hugely complex because today the uh, defensive uh, uh, architecture of most companies in the market are built in average with 14, 15 vendors of different stuff for cybersecurity. Uh, so IPSs, firewalls, uh, network gear, everybody with his management system, which is policy language, and is a huge mess for them changing stuff. Okay, so you go into routers in some companies and you see huge access list and say, what's that? Don't touch it. I don't know because it was done 10 years ago, but don't touch it. It may be some kind of access list that is very important. So it's unmanageable, completely unmanageable, okay? Uh, so in a, w when you start to connect things, which means for a company, let's say uh, 150 people company, so a medium company in Italy, 100 million uh, turnaround, 150 people. Today they have probably 200 stuff connected. So it will be the PCs, some servers, 
When you start to connect the machines, it will be soon 2,000, 20,000. And if you have a bad architecture, you will not cope with that, okay? So that's the issue that IoT is bringing into companies. The complexity is going like 10, 100 times, okay? It's exponential. So um, here is a, is a customer, the Italians would probably uh, recognize the name, is a steel company where we are working with. And what we did with them is completely redesign their uh, manufacturing plant that uh, the, the network of the manufacturing plant why because they are migrating to wireless wi-fi the command and control signals of these big machines upper left in the picture that are bringing okay it's completely out automated so people don't get hurt uh, But guess what? Someone gets in control of that stuff, right? It's a pretty serious <laughs> issue. So what? Ju just to um, make you the example. So today, if you want to do um, co connect machines inside industrial operation, you have to redesign everything. That's that's the point. Okay. Um, At Cisco, uh, we started to spot this issue probably three, four years ago, and we started to make huge investments. So we have invested five billion in the last three years, only in acquisitions, only in acquisitions. Don't name R&D. Probably we have two, two three thousand people working on cybersecurity in R&D, but also we spent five billion in cash and stocks to acquire 10, 15, companies on cybersecurity. Uh, why? Because we believe that networks are not the only, but for sure the main place where you should start uh, thinking about security. So whereas up to now security was on top of the network, so application security, a firewall between routers and so on, now with the scale that is uh, happening now, you have to have it embedded in the network, okay? I give you a couple of examples. So with SDN, obviously, everybody knows about SDN? Well, okay, thank you. Just shout if I say something uh, silly and, <laughs> and not understandable. Uh, with SDN, obviously, you have the benefit of being able, able to program networks, as, as we were saying. So there are a lot of interesting information about the user context. I'm, uh, I'm Enrico. I have installed this kind of apps on my PC. I'm using a Mac with a certain release of uh, Safari, whatever, uh, and, uh, and uh, the operating system. I'm connecting from the university, and I'm connecting today, which is Thursday, okay? So a lot of information that if I apply it with a policy and say, When can Enrico connect? How can Enrico connect? And so on. Uh, give a pretty solid uh, uh, defense, first level of defense. And this is usually not used in networks, okay? So just imagine you're starting to plug things, IoT. Hmm? Let's say connected bulbs. And then your connected bulbs start to do some shopping on Amazon. So you shit. <laughs> He's buying stuff on Amazon. I, I'm just joking, but doing stuff that he shouldn't do, let's say. You know it's a bulb, you know it's going to Amazon, mm, and probably already these two elements with a serious, po pretty simple policy should say, okay, stop the stuff here. <laughs> no more, okay? Disconnect the bulb from, from the connected bulb from the, from the network. So this is a, 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 a simple example to say, in the network we have a lot of information that is not used today for security purpose, okay? Uh, so if you correlate all of this, you have a sensor in the network. And this is a little bit a part of our strategy, so let's use the network as a sensor for, se for security, okay?
whatever. Uh, basically, here is another uh, interesting feature, which is the network segmentation. So network segmentation, we have it forever. I mean, we invented the VLAN, uh, I don't know, it was 30 years ago, maybe, maybe more. Uh, but again, it's not used. Okay, it's very simple to, because why it's not used? Because it's not that everything I connect, I should go into the router, into a switch, put the access list, uh, take the right VLAN, blah, blah, blah. It's too complex. So again, with automation, okay, and maybe a little bit also of artificial intelligence, you can auto-detect the context, auto-detect who is connecting, and apply a policy. So an employee can do this and this and this and can speak only with that and that. A light bulb cannot speak with servers. That's it, no? Uh, so automatic segmentation is, is very important. So we are working on protocols between things and network to advertise themselves. Okay, I'm a thing, I'm a, a, an industrial machine, I'm a, I'm a light bulb, I'm whatever. And so I get automatically assigned a policy and automatic network segmentation. This is another interesting uh, um, feature. Another stuff, uh, uh, and we were discussing it um, before, okay, is about encrypted traffic. So this, this is a patent of a couple of researchers inside Cisco, which is pretty interesting. And uh, is about, uh, I don't remember the percentage, but probably two thirds of the um, traffic uh, is now HTTPS is encrypted. Uh, uh, basically, right? And also malware uses a lot encrypted tunnels. Uh, so what, uh, what we developed is a hardware feature inside the, the forwarding, uh, uh, let's say, engine of, uh, of switches and routers that looks at the uh, packets, encrypted packets, and can spot with a pretty high accuracy uh, if it's an attack, if it's a malware or not, okay? Uh, basically, it's like I'm looking at the glass there and I see two people speaking with each other. And if I see them like screaming, say, okay, they are, they are having an argument, right? Without hearing, I can see more or less they are having an argument or they are speaking quietly. Uh, okay, this is a basic way to, to say how this malware detection works. And this is a, a pretty interesting feature. And again, is a lot of information that is inside the network. You can do it only if you do it inside the hardware at wire speed, because unless it's too slow. Uh, but again, is how the network is is helping. Um, yeah, this is the one. Uh, is how the network is uh, is helping to detect malware. Okay. Finally. Uh, all this information that you have from firewalls, routers, uh, uh, from this encrypted traffic, if you start to correlate it not only locally inside a company, but among all the companies of the world, is another very interesting piece of information. So what we did is uh, we have an organization, it's called Talos, uh, uh, maybe some of you have heard, they are releasing some security advisories pretty pretty often in terms of malware analysis. Uh, and, uh, and this organization has 250, 300 people, analysts working on malware day and night. Okay, so what they are doing is, wor everybody with his specialization, uh, uh, they are working on analyzing certain patterns to see if it's malware or not, and certain IP address sources if they are releasing malware or not. And uh, also, they are getting information from 150 million of routers, switches, and gear around the world, firewalls, uh, IPSs around the world, every day, okay? So basically, obviously, there is not only 250 people, but there is a big uh, artificial intelligence, uh, art maybe it's too much, machine learning kind of uh, pseudo-intelligence to analyze all this stuff, okay? So th uh, they are processing 120 terabyte per day, okay? And basically identify 20 billion threats per day. Just to give you a, a hint, uh, the number of Google searches every day are 3 billion. So we see 20 billion attacks per day. 
why we are doing this? Because then all the stuff that we learn here, we s tell it back to the network and say, hey, Mr. Firewall, hey, Mr. Edge Device, if you see this pattern, then it's, uh, it's a malware, okay? So it's intelligence that, uh, that you can only have if you have a huge number of sources that you analyze, so 150 million sources, but then you have to give back no, to basically to the community to say, hey, this is a problem. If you see this pattern, it's a problem, okay? So this is another interesting, and, and this is probably also a part of the future of cybersecurity, so there will be uh, artificial intelligence behind it to automate and make it even quicker and quicker and quicker, okay? So that's one point. Another interesting place to look at traffic, always in the network, I'm speaking about network, is the DNS, right? Everybody is typing stuff in the DNS and maybe you are typing a little bit the wrong address and you go, who God knows, knows where you are going, right? And what you are downloading. Uh, so we did a, uh, an acquisition of a very cool company it's called OpenDNS. Uh, that is exactly filtering, okay, all these DNS requests, it's for security purpose and alerting you, okay, you are not going the right way, okay? Uh, and uh, here you can see the statistics, so it's like uh, uh, 7 million uh, enforcements per day uh, in terms of uh, uh, DNS resolution and all other kind of statistics you can see here. Uh, the interesting thing about the open DNS stuff, let me see if I can get rid of the animation, okay, is, is the following. So when an attack uh, is coming, obviously, usually you see mm, the consequence, okay? So um, uh, when, when a malware is spreading, usually people, uh, okay, get the malware, then the PC probably is contacting some command and control somewhere in the internet to get instruction to run the malware, right? And if you are able to block that call, you are pretty, pretty safe, so uh, you, you can avoid the most of the damage, okay? A and this is a, is a pretty cool defense to do with DNS because usually they don't have hard-coded uh, IP address. They have uh, uh, DNS entries because then they change the IP address dynamically, the attackers, in order to get uh, um, ahead of who is hunting them. Uh, and so if you have a DNS that is knowing that this is part of a malware call, you can block it, okay? And, uh, and, and it's pretty effective. But the interesting stuff it that is that you can also go before the uh, patient zero hit. So before the first infected, I'm, this is the last slide. Huh? <laughs> um, why you can go before? Because maybe you can track back and it's a little bit visible but basically if you start to correlate again machine learning and huge database if you start to correlate the new um, domain registrations okay that are happening someone is registering a new domain but this someone that is registering a new domain historically already registered 10 domains that were spreading malware guess what maybe this new domain can be malware as well okay so if you start to do this correlation, you can even prevent and know that this particular uh, DNS request may be coming from a malware. And also prevent also the first patient, okay? So this is the kind of things that if you are in the middle of everything, which means if you are in the network with big correlations, you, you can start to, I mean, mm, give some value back in terms of cybersecurity. Okay, that was all. If there are questions, I'm here. And uh, thanks for listening. I hope it was interesting. A big question maybe you can take uh, for uh, Enrico. Yeah. Speak loudly.
So security issues in, uh, in FOC computing. So first of all, it's uh, about the authenticity of applications, right? If you start to move up, FOC computing is also about moving the application, think about a smart road. You, can, you could, in a smart road, connected road, move the application along with, uh, uh, I don't know, the traffic, right? Uh, or an area where the issue is, and run the application locally, or in a smart city, you could run dynamically application at the crossroads, uh, depending on which application is needed there at, the, at that specific time, right? In order to, because you don't have infinite computing. Uh, so when you start to move application around is uh, uh, how do I sign an application? How do I know if an uh, application is authentic? Firstly, secondly, is also if it is authentic, uh, how do you know that is not doing um, damages to other applications or to the network or to other stuff that is attached to the network, right? Because you are running things in the network which is pretty, <laughs> pretty serious, so you have to be very careful on that, right? So this is the main, main things that we are looking at, okay? Okay, now uh, I would ask, uh, meanwhile, Enora to set up. So we did close a bit the uh, blind to make uh, the screen more visible, not to put you in the sleep mode, please. Uh, so we have to uh, catch up with time. So either I ask you to skip the lunch, or I ask Eleonora and Alberto to shrink a bit their presentation. You can vote. Okay, so I see from your eyes uh, you don't want to skip the lunch. So please, uh, Eleonora and Alberto, try to make your presentation a bit shorter. And uh, so the first talk of this session will be by Eleonora Losiuk, which is a postdoc in our uh, research group. <coughs> okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Eleonora Losiuk, and I am a, a postdoc research fellow in uh, the Spritz group. So today I would like to talk uh, to you about uh, uh, one current research uh, topic that I'm working on, which regards uh, um, content popularity in ICN networks. So this is uh, briefly the outline of my presentation, but uh, I will go immediately through it. So actually we have already introduced the concept of ICN and uh, uh, um, about the fact that is a, a new uh, topology, a new architecture that proposing uh, a switch from uh, a network based on IP addresses uh, towards a different one which is content centric. So I actually ICN is the idea and NDN is one of the possible implementations. So NDN which stays for uh, uh, named data networking in is uh, one of the possible architectures that are uh, uh, that have been implemented and that uh, follows uh, this new paradigm. I will mainly concentrate it on uh, mainly concentrate on uh, NDN because it's uh, actually the architecture that we chose to to work on. As we already said, uh, um, ICN and all the, the different architectures are based on content. Uh, so actually, every content in ICN is made uh, uh, is uh, made of a different uh, of a single path, which is made of uh, different human readable names, uh, and. Actually, the content is delivered in the network only after an interest is being uh, uh, sent. So since uh, every ICN network is based on uh, a pool uh, paradigm, uh, all the consumers have a thirst to ask uh, uh, for, a for a specific content uh, through an interest, uh, and then uh, they will get back uh, the associated content. So for every interest, uh, we have uh, not, uh, not only the name of the content that uh, we would like to retrieve, uh, but also additional information. For example, if we want uh, that uh, the um, content that is coming back uh, to us uh, is uh, mm, some kind of filtered, or uh, uh, whether we, we would like to prove the freshness of our interest so that we um, add within the interest packet also announce. On the other side, the content, uh, the content packet, uh, the content messages, uh, not only uh, contains the name of the content uh, which is uh, brought into the network, uh, but also, of course, the data and the signature made by the producer so that we can prove that the content is uh, authentic. Um, so actually, uh, how can we define content popularity? The definition is very simple because uh, uh, we can say that, uh, we can say that uh, 
popularity of a content can be um, identified by the number of requests for that content over the number of all the requests that uh, have been made in a network. Um, so th this is a very simple and intuitive uh, uh, definition. And if we uh, look at, um, at this uh, simple topology, we have uh, three consumers. We have already um, illustrated their role in a Nicene network, which means uh, every consumer will request a specific uh, content or a set of contents. We have routers, which are responsible for uh, redirecting those interests and giving back the content to the consumers. And finally, we have producers, the only ones that can actually push the contents in the network. Um, so if we think about uh, uh, the dynamic state uh, of the network, uh, of course, consumers uh, at some point will send uh, their interest in the network. Uh, and if we would like to measure content popularity, what we, what we actually acquire is the number of requests for a specific content, for example, content A, over uh, the total number of requests that are uh, sent in the network. Um, so this is a very general introduction. We will see uh, later uh, how many factors in an ICN network actually affect uh, the definition or the measurement of content popularity. So every content actually is uh, affected or at least its popularity is affected by a lot of uh, different elements. First of all, the publisher. Uh, of course, if we consider, an, um, for example, a very important uh, person, uh, Angela Merkel, just to give an example, if she publishes something in the network, of course, uh, she will get much more pop popularity than me, than a, than a content published by me. Another point uh, is the content, uh, the topic of the content. So, for example, if uh, the content uh, uh, addresses uh, computer, computer science or music or uh, sport, it will have a different content, uh, a different popularity. The time, the actual time uh, at which you publish a content also matters. And finally, also the location. So there are also uh, additional features that uh, affect the popularity of content uh, and all of them uh, at the end uh, provide the, uh, the measurement that uh, we are trying to, to collect. As already said, the uh, popularity of a content is a, like an, um, a general and global property of the content itself uh, which is spread all over the network. The point is that uh, even though this uh, uh, property is global, we have to measure it, uh, and when we have to measure, we have to choose also a specific point uh, where to measure this content, this uh, popularity. Uh, why do we care about the content popularity in ICN, or at least uh, in any context? Uh, the point is that uh, uh, popularity of contents is very important for different purposes. First of all, for example, for fun. So every kind, every one of us has a profile either on Twitter, or Instagram, Facebook, or any other kind of social media. And uh, probably when publish a content, would like that that content is, um, will reach a uh, high popularity. A second example could be profit. Um, agencies, brand agencies that use uh, social media actually uh, create um, pages in order to get a feedback from their customers. So they use those pages in order to have a feedback about the popularity of their uh, Actually, they use the popularity of their pages in order to get a feedback from customers uh, in relation to their products. On the other side, uh, uh, caching-enabled systems also are, uh, really care about uh, the content popularity because, of course, if they know a priori uh, which are the contents po that are really popular, can push the contents in different points of the network. And finally, what we really care about uh, is uh, security and privacy. In NDN, as any, ad any other ICN network, uh, um, content popularity is a very strong property that affects, uh, or at least is a um, leader in uh, different attacks. Uh, more specifically, the three ones that I would like to briefly mention are cache pollution attacks, uh, uh, content poisoning attacks, and interest flooding attacks, which are affected by content popularity. So the first one, the aim of the first attack uh, is actually uh, to fill the routers uh, to fill the router's caches with the contents that are not popular in the network. Um, so the attacker has two different ways to do this, to achieve this, his aim. The first one is called the locality disruption, and uh, it is based on a high level, uh, um, high number of requests for a set of non popular contents, so that uh, the attacker starts uh, sending a lot of requests for a set of non popular contents in the network. The second one is false locality which means that the attacker uses a small set of, uh, um, of contents 
and starts requesting like a uniform uh, number of requests for that contents. The, the final results uh, is the following. The final results is the following one. If we consider again the same topology, at the same at the same point, uh, uh, the consumers will send uh, their request. We have understood that the um, uh, the, the interest of these uh, of a specific content will go through each router until reaching a producer, and then the content will get back to consumers. So after uh, considering different uh, um, parameters uh, of setting up this uh, topology, at some point, the router one, for example, will cache this content, content A. So the purpose of the attacker is to force that ro router to cache a, a content that is not popular. So what uh, he, can s he can do is to start uh, sending a lot of uh, um, interest uh, of request uh, for uh, a set of not specific, uh, not popular contents, so that at some point router, which is uh, uh, like a stupid uh, component of the, of the network, will understand that that, that that specific content, for example, content Z, has become popular and will try to cache, will actually cache. The final, um, the final setup would is that uh, router one will cache an unpopular, a not popular content, and consumers uh, will be prevented from uh, um, actually uh, from the one of the first property of ICN networks, which is uh, caching. So, uh, without the attacker, the first router will cache uh, a content which can be delivered to consumers, uh, so that they will appreciate uh, a very short latency. With the, uh, with an ongoing attack, uh, router one will cache up a, s um, a content that will be never requested, uh, and every time a new consumer will ask for a different content, he will have to wait uh, for the full path uh, of uh, so that his interest mm, goes from uh, himself until the producer and goes back. So the point of this attack is to uh, increase the latency and uh, damage the first property of ICN networks, which is uh, uh, providing the uh, providing the contents to the consumers uh, from any point of the network. The second attack uh, which is uh, affected by popularity, content popularity is content poisoning attacks, uh, which aims at uh, uh, this time filling the uh, router's caches with uh, content that are contents that are poisoned. So once again, if we have this uh, setup, uh, so consumers asking for, rec for uh, specific contents that at some point are cached in routers, uh, in the topology, this time the attacker tries to put uh, into the um, into the caches of the routers a uh, poisoned content, and the final result, uh, of course, will be that uh, consumers still ask will still ask for the same content, but this time the content will be poisoned and will be distributed all over the network and all over the consumers. The final, uh, the third one, the third attack that I would like to describe is the, the interest flooding attack, which uh, aims at uh, uh, putting down uh, a service inside the network. This, mm, in this case, the service, the target service, is the pending interest table of a router, so that the router, which uh, uh, the router will not be able anymore to handle the requests from the legitimate consumers. So every, cons every time uh, a consumer sends an interest, uh, this interest uh, is uh, uh, intercepted by a router and is uh, an a new entry is uh, put uh, inside the, um, the PIT, the pending interest table. Then the interest is forwarded to the, uh, to the sequence, to, to the other uh, router, in this case the second router, and this process continues until the request uh, reaches the producer. So in the first path that comes from the goes that goes from the consumer until the producer, every router will put uh, uh, an additional entry in uh, his um, its pit. As uh, as uh, as has already been said, for every di different interest, there will be a new entry in the PIT, and whenever a new interest, uh, sorry, a new request for the same interest will come, this will collapse in the same entry. So at the end, uh, um, in a dynamic state, uh, the routers will have their PIT full of entries, each one associated to a specific interest, and for each entry, they will exactly know which consumers have requested that content. So for example, in that case, uh, both routers uh, exactly uh, know that uh, 
consumer one has requested uh, the interest, uh, the green interest, uh, the green uh, content, while consumer two has requested uh, the blue content. The point uh, of uh, uh, interest code in a tax uh, in this case is to uh, fool the PAT of routers. How, once again, sending a lot of requests for uh, um, contents that are legitimate, I mean, that uh, so that the routers actually don't uh, drop them, and uh, uh, so that they can still redirect and forward inside the network. Meanwhile, um, inserting a new entry in, the in their PAT. So the final result is that both, uh, both PATs uh, for both routers uh, will be completed, uh, will be full of uh, entries associated to um, contents that will be never provided to the network. And most important, uh, with a PAT which is completely full, a router is not able to handle any kind of request from a legitimate consumer. Because uh, as, uh, as it has already been uh, said, uh, the cache for a router is uh, not uh, mandatory. A, a router can choose whether to cache contents or not, but the PAT is a mandatory component. So in order to uh, intercept uh, an interest and to forward properly, a router needs to have uh, uh, an empty space uh, in, uh, in its own uh, PAT. So in this uh, kind of attack, uh, the, um, the target is to, to fool uh, the PAT of uh, routers. So actually, in every kind of attack, uh, if you think about it, the content popularity is a very strong, uh, uh, is the leader. So for cache pollution attacks, the point is uh, to uh, make, uh, to, uh, like to change uh, the perception of popularity from a router point of view. Po routers uh, cannot perceive the real popularity. They just receive interest. Uh, and if an attacker starts uh, uh, sending requests for not popular contents, they will be uh, affected by this uh, attack. In content poisoning, once again, the, proper the, uh, the problem of content popularity is that uh, router cannot understand whether a, mm, a content is poisoned or not. So he just receives, uh, maybe uh, calculates some metrics in order to understand whether the content is popular or not and decided whether to cache it or not. But it cannot detect uh, if uh, the, um, the content is either really popular or poisoned. Uh, in the same way, in interest coding attacks, uh, the um, attacker, like uh, if we think about content popularity, the content popularity is like a mirror of uh, the behavior of legitimate consumers. And the attacker wants to break this pattern in order to, again, to put down the service, which in this, uh, in this case is the router PAT. So as I said, uh, this is a global property, which is provided, which is, uh, the content popularity is a global property. So a content is popular all over the, ne over the network. The point is that for measuring the popularity, we need to choose a point. That point means uh, uh, a component, which could be a consumer, a router, or a producer in the network. And when we measure the popularity of a content, of course, the point that we choose matter. Because, uh, uh, okay, matter. Um, for example, in this topology, if we, have, uh, if we assume that uh, the black content is, ca is cached in router one, and the green content is uh, cached in uh, router two. What is the different uh, uh, popularity that we measure for each content according to the point that we choose? Okay, if we start uh, thinking about the consumer, we can simply see which interest that consumer sends. And according to the interest that he sends, we can see whether, uh, we can see which contents are really popular for that consumer. If we choose a different point, uh, for example, router one, probably the, um, the result will be the same for that consumer because in this topology we have just one consumer connected to the router. So actually the interest sent from the consumer will be the same received from the router. So uh, we can still see the same popularity. But what about uh, the third router? So the third router is uh, really affected by the caching property which is uh, the one of the main property of ICN networks. Router, the third router is actually not able to see the request uh, sent by the consumer for the black and the green uh, contents. Why? Because uh, they, are uh, they, are cached in the, um, they are stored in the caches of the routers one and two. So every time consumer asks uh, for the black or the green content, 
his, uh, his request will be immediately uh, fulfilled by the first, either the first or the second router, but those requests will never reach the third one. So actually, uh, in this example, the third one, I mean, the first three routers have a freely different uh, uh, perception of uh, the popularity of the content black green and green. So uh, actually, the first router will see every content, every request. The second router will see just uh, the green one, but not the black one. And the third router will never see any request. So actually, if we uh, query the, route the third router, maybe he can say he can ask, uh, ask that uh, the content, uh, the black content and the green content are not popular, while the effective measurement is completely the opposite. What other uh, features affect the popularity of a content? Uh, well, first of all, the, lif the lifetime of the content. When the content is uh, sent into the, is uh, spread into the network uh, and provided by a producer, uh, the producer also marks that content uh, uh, in terms of lif lifetime. So uh, when the content should be, should exp expire uh, in a router. Another uh, strong uh, property that affects the popularity is the caching strategies. So every router can choose among uh, a set of different strategies uh, for caching or not a content. Just to give an example, the very uh, simplest uh, strategy for caching is the leave copy everywhere. So when the consumer sends an interest, this passes through every router until, th uh, uh, until it reaches the producer. So uh, at the setup, the content is mm, saved or uh, available only on the producer node. When the interest reaches the producer, uh, the content uh, will be uh, forwarded on the backward. And in the leave copy everywhere strategy, each router which is uh, in the path will cache the content. So actually, after the int an interest is sent, uh, we will have, uh, uh, and the data will be returned, we will have the content cached all over the network. The second strategy, uh, among a set of different strategies is the leave copy down, which actually uh, saves uh, the content, pushes just the fourth router to cache the content, which means that uh, uh, the consumer has sent an interest and on the way back, uh, only the fourth router has, cache, uh, has cached the content. Whenever the consumer sends a new interest uh, and this reaches the fourth router, then he will, of course, uh, uh, fulfill the request, uh, but also he will uh, push the, the third router to cache the same content. So that uh, the point is, uh, we, thir we first uh, cache the content uh, in the node which is uh, closest to the producer, but as soon as we receive uh, uh, additional numerous uh, requests for that content, of course, the content will be uh, like cached uh, to all the network, all the network components that are closer to the consumer, to the component that makes the request. Another important feature is the router caches, uh, cache sizes. Of course, routers are finite uh, and uh, physical elements with a finite dimension for uh, their caches. So, when the cache is full, how can they? Uh, can they save, still save some content? They have to replace them. And they can use different strategies also uh, called cache eviction, uh, cache eviction policies. So every time a, cache, uh, a router has a cache completely full, he has to choose which content to be replaced, uh, needs to be replaced. Among the different strategies, there is the list recently used, uh, which refers to the time. So the um, content which is saved in the cache, uh, which has been saved uh, in the longest time will be removed. The least frequently used uh, will remove the ones that has been requested uh, uh, fewer times. First in, first out uh, will remove uh, the first uh, content that has been placed uh, in the cache. Finally, the random uh, strategy will just pick up randomly a content and throw it away. A uh, the fifth uh, uh, feature that we identified that can be can affect the, con the content popularity is uh, whether there are some ongoing attacks. So th this is just a very uh, high level and general uh, uh, overview of the different uh, properties and features of ICM that could affect uh, the popularity of a content. So actually, even though the popularity of a content is a uh, global, mm, global feature, when we measure 
we are affect this measurement is affected by not only by the point but but also uh, by these uh, five uh, uh, properties of net of the network itself so as I said uh, from a security and privacy point of view content popularity is important because uh, it is a strong uh, um, it is a the leader of three different kinds of attacks and if we wanted to prevent the attacks uh, uh, using the content popularity we need to characterize the content popularity possible approaches uh, the possible approaches that we identified are two either to choose uh, a content based approach or to choose a network based approach so actually the first one is to uh, aims at uh, identifying and analyzing all the properties of the content itself this is just a brief uh, uh, idea of uh, this approach so s the idea is to take uh, the content itself and understand uh, uh, which properties of that content affect the popularity which means for example if i i'm analyzing a youtube video i know that uh, First of all, the, co the concept of, co of popularity for a video means uh, the number of views uh, of that video, which is uh, completely different uh, from the concept of popularity, for example, of an online views uh, or a Twitter message. So for a Twitter message, uh, the popularity is measured in terms of uh, number of retweets. So first of all, even the uh, definition of popularity for the content is very, for each content is very different. But also there are a lot of other features uh, that are very different from each type of content to a different one. So there are a lot of studies that try to uh, find a, um, a trend according to the specific type of content uh, and how the popularity of that content uh, distributes all over the network. But the problem uh, within this approach is that we need to know a priori all the type of contents <coughs> and all their features uh, and all their distributions so it's quietly impossible the other approach uh, which is the one that we are trying to to achieve is to uh, to analyze and to consider only the network the network features which means uh, the five the um, the four one that uh, uh, the four ones that i've explained before so if we consider uh, so if we consider a topology network uh, and we chose a point uh, and we choose uh, a specific uh, content can we measure the global popularity of that content from that point uh, even though there it is uh, like uh, a router placed in the central part of a network topology considering content lifetime uh, strategies uh, router caches and also eviction policy policies uh, that are uh, actually going on our proposal is to put all together to uh, also with uh, some uh, probably rules uh, and uh, nets in order to identify a content popularity model which could allow us uh, to again find a measure uh, measurement point inside an topology and from that point uh, measure the real popularity of a content as i said uh, our final purpose is to defeat the attacker so for every kind of uh, this uh, type of attacks uh, we would like to um, identify characterize the content popularity and to use uh, the this measurement in order to prevent uh, those attacks so for cache pollution we would be able to see to say whether the pop the contents are popular or not uh, as well as for content poisoning attack we could prevent uh, the poisoned one from be from being uh, cached and in case of interest flooding we can identify whether the contents that are requested by the attacker are really popular or not so starting from a from a single property or feature we would like to extend uh, the mitigation of uh, three possible attacks uh, in uh, ndn or uh, especially in icn networks thanks uh, for your attention questions okay then we can take the discussion during the lunch maybe and the next talk will be by uh, Alberto Compagno which is was uh, is a former member of uh, our research group and now is uh, with Cisco lab in uh, Paris
Okay, thank you. So, uh, before starting this talk, which I'm trying to be fast actually, so let's say give me 15 minutes more or less and then we can go to lunch. Okay, so let me spend like 10 seconds to say where, uh, who I am and where I came from. Actually, you know, I am a software engineer and a postdoc researcher in Cisco. Uh, I came from, uh, I come from uh, uh, a research uh, lab, which is called PIRL. It stands for uh, Paris Innovation and Research Lab. And it's part of, you know, all the big uh, research uh, department in Cisco. And uh, I am part of the ICN team in Cisco. And in that lab, there are different and several research groups, mainly doing research on networking, like in SDN or in segment routing and so on. So uh, today I'm going to present what we call the hybrid ICN, so hybrid information center networking, and it is a technology that we are working on in Cisco to try to bring ICN inside uh, IP, the current uh, internet protocol. So should work. Yep. So let me skip this as we already had two to talk about ICN, so you are all experts, I guess, now in ICN. And let's go directly to this one. So here we have uh, the uh, ICN packets on the left and the IP packet on the right. So, I mean, both Professor Tsudik and uh, Eleonora just explained all the good features of ICN. We love ICN because it's it increases availability, it reduces latency, it brings more security into the network. Um, the ICN approach, actually the research uh, approach of developing ICN was a more uh, clean slate approach, which means that, I mean, they when they designed ICN, they didn't care about being compatible to what we have nowadays. They just wanted to, to, to use what they knew about the, the today's internet uh, architecture, uh, take the best of it, and then design a new one, which was able to overcome the current limitation, right? So when they did that, actually, they do all the design about the infrastructure, the packet format, and the uh, forwarder. So uh, this is the results, basically, that we have two different packets, which have um, their own formatting for being expressed, right? And in ICN, what they use, they use what is called a type length value, which basically allows to have a flexible header that you can express by using this type length value that are basically a three values. One is the type that defines what the field is containing. The other is the length, which says that the field is up to this number of bits, and then we have the value. So <coughs> ICN packets doesn't have a, mm. okay, ICN packets, as I was saying, I mean, they don't have like a, a fixed header as in IP which we all know exactly where to find a specific uh, uh, value and how long it is, like the IP address in IPv6 is uh, 124 bits. But for example, the names, which can be as long as you like, they were using this approach here. So if you think about bringing ICN into IP, so the only way that you can have ICN working with IP is basically bringing ICN on top of IP or replacing IP or making it under IP, right? because there's no way that this type of packets, which are made by the type line value, can be compatible with what we have nowadays in IP. And basically the problem is that current routers only understand this formatting here, right? And it's not just because of they, they, they have been programmed in this way, but it's also because the hardware is, uh, has been designed to, to, to point directly to specific fields there, right? So if you really want to exploit the existing hardware, ICN, you cannot use ICN, basically. And this is a problem, basically, to uh, to get ICN spread through, through throughout the internet. So that's why the current ICN deployments, there are a few of them already existing uh, and uh, out there, which mostly are for research purposes, like the Indian testbed. And so what they do, basically, they encapsulate ICN packets inside IP every time you want to talk using ICN between two uh, router or hosts that are remote. Um, what's the drawback of this? Uh, basically, you need to set up manually in a router or uh, in a host 
which are the next stop available in order to be able to encapsulate ICM packet inside the, the right inside the right IP, right? To express the, the destination address. So <coughs> with uh, hybrid ICN, what we want to do is basically to take all the disrupting network principle that ICN is proposing without disrupting the underlying network in infrastructure. So the main uh, idea is basically to map ICN packets inside IP packet. So we, are we in uh, hybrid ICN, basically we don't change anything about IP, IPv4 or IPv6, and we map what we need inside what we, we already have as a fields in IP packets. Uh, the point is that we change the semantics of some fields without changing the formatic, the, the format, right? So from an IP router, when is it going to receive an HICN packet, that packet will look like exactly as an IPv4 or IPv6 packet, six packet. So it can keep using the existing uh, hardware or software to be able to forward that packet up to the next hope. Uh, so in order to give you a better idea of what our vision is this thing here, basically, you know, uh, we don't believe that as Professor Sudik say before that we, you can shut down the internet, update all the routers, and then you have ICN uh, uh, for free. That's never gonna happen. So what is gonna happen is that you will have some IPv6 router and IC HICN for Word that start pop-ups one after the other, right? You start deploying uh, them sequentially. <coughs> and all of them has to coexist, basically. They still need to be able to forward packets and to give connectivity to the hand host, as well as uh, we need to act at the hand host. There's no way we can have ICN or HICN working and be used if the hand host doesn't talk HICN or ICN, right? So the idea of HACN is to work on three main points, which is the network, so the forwarder, uh, to redefine the ICN or HACN packets in order to be compatible with IPv6, and to create uh, what is needed at the hand host to let developers to design their application and to use HACN. So the motivation, as I just told you, uh, beside the shorter time deployment that HACN should bring, are also to minimize the, standard, the standardization effort. If you really want that everyone start using uh, technology, then you need to start doing some standards. Otherwise, people will, will, we will always create their own uh, example or their own prototype or whatever it is, format, and uh, no one will converge. Uh, we also want to minimize the clean slate approach. So it's no longer gonna be to clean slate, but try to reuse what you already have without giving up of any of the H ICN feature that researcher has, has bring up so far. Uh <coughs> and uh, again, as I was saying, we want HICN router and IPv6 or 4 router to be able to talk to each other, which means that we also want to be able to fall back to IP if something goes wrong or if we need, right? So, <coughs> as I told you, we have three main points, naming the network architecture and application. So the point is, how do we map uh, ICN names into an IPv6 or 4 address? Well, we define a new uh, address family, which we call uh, AFHICN, which is compatible with what is defined in IPv6 and also IPv4. Here, I just only have the example of uh, IPv6, so the first 64 bits are gonna be the routable one, which the routers are gonna use to forward packets. And the last 64 bit are gonna use to express some resource prefix, right, as a producer prefix. So if you take all of them together, that's gonna be uh, a producer prefix, which is going to be used to route interest up to the producer. And the <coughs> name suffix, we are gonna carry it into uh, the layer four header, like the TCP or the, U the UDP one. So what's what's are the open issues in doing this? So we define, let's say, a class of uh, addresses, but we don't actually know when we receive an address if it is a regular IPv6 or an HICN, because it looks like exactly the same, right? It's just uh, 124 bits that represent like a number. So, <coughs> Uh, one idea might be to standardize some 
uh, subnets, some networks that only belongs to HICN, or another idea is to exploit the control plane. So everyone is gonna use uh, an IPv uh, address to use HICN, is going to advertise the neighbors, and then we are gonna exploit the control, a control protocol to diffuse and to propagate this information. So we're gonna have some local control man management that will take care of set up routers in order to uh, process that particular prefix as an HICN one. So the packet format, in uh, ICN we have two different packet formats, in IP we have only one, right? So uh, we define an IP pack an, uh, an interest packet as an IP packet which contains the layer three header plus the layer four header. Mostly interests are not gonna have any payload, so uh, this, this will work. It might happen that we need some small payload for some particular reason. This doesn't prevent uh, of using that. Uh, while on the data packet, we are gonna have also the payload as it's gonna be the content carried by the packet. So, uh, again, in uh, IP we have two different prefixes, sorry, e addresses, right? We have the source one and the destination one. In ICN, mostly we use one address, which is the one that points to the, con to the content. So the, the idea is where do we map that address in an IP packet. Since interest forwarding is done by the interest name, right? So we need to map that name into the destination address, which is what is currently used by AP router, right? They use the destination address to perform a lookup in their feed and then to, the, to find the, the, the next uh, hope to forward the packet. In the source address, uh, what we are going to write, we are going to write the IP address that belong to the interface of the host that is forwarding that, the HIC and enable host that is forwarding that interest to the network. For the content, we are gonna use the source address, and the reason is that content are not forwarding using the, the content name, but actually in the uh, regular IP, not the, not the pitless one, uh, the forwarding of content is due to some state that is stored in the routers, right? The one that we'll find in a pit. So even in this case, we are gonna, <coughs> we are gonna use th that state, and we are gonna write that state, which basically will be the source address of the previous HICN hope from which we receive the interest to forward the packet. In this way, we are able to enforce uh, the symmetric path between uh, uh, interest and data between HICN uh, uh, routers. So this is what we are going to use, what we are using about the layer for packet. I mean, I'm not going into all the details, just to show you that here, usually you will find the sequence number of TCP. We are going to use the name suffix, which is mostly carrying the same uh, information, like the chunking information that allows you then to, to retrieve all the different chunks and to um, reconstruct the application data unit. We don't touch the ports because it's really dangerous if you want to be compatible with nowadays for water. So that are still there. About security, <coughs> so uh, ICN used to sign, ICN used to um, let producer to sign data packet, right? Packet per packet. We have that approach, which is the one that you see on the, on the left in between the two different packets. And we define an authentication adder, we call it that, that way, but it's basically what you will find in a signature header in, uh, in uh, ICN. In this case, the authentication adder doesn't really need to be compatible with what is already there, because we are not exploiting anything so far. So we just place it after the layer four in order to be sure that no one that is just looking between the layer three and four is going to, to use it or to <coughs> to exploit it. Uh, the second approach that we have, and this is basically to reduce uh, the computation that you need to sign packets, which is uh, quite a lot, it's used uh, um, a manifest, basically. So we inherited this from the CCNX project. And basically a manifest is nothing more than a list or an index of names uh, associated with the hash of the packet uh, carrying that, that, that content, right? 
and the manifest is signed, this allows to get the same uh, security properties that you will have uh, signing data per data, except that you don't sign data per data, but you sign only one for a number of data. So you will reduce the amount of computation that you need at the producer side. So the forwarding path, uh, this is mostly unchanged from the ICN. What you see here is a regular IP uh, forwarder, the one that is all blank. And uh, we have like an HICN uh, <coughs> module that is the blue one, which is a packet cache. This is a convenient way for expressing both the PIT and the content store, which is holding, again, interest and data. So forwarding, it will be exactly as in ICN. So if you receive an interest uh, and you are a router, you will do a first uh, lookup in the, in the content store. If you have a match, you forward the, the data back. If you don't have a match, you do a lookup in the pit. If you have a match there, you collapse the pit. Otherwise, you, you'll do a lookup in the FIB in order to find the, the next top, right? The difference with ICN here is when we send out the packet. ICN, for interest, doesn't need to do any sort of rewriting. Here we need to do, and basically, I'll, I'll remember you that an interest, which is an IP packet, is carried the interest name in the destination address. That remains unchanged. But what we are going to rewrite is the source name, which is going to be the address of the egress interface from which the interest is forwarded. That's because we want that the data will arrive from the same interface in order to uh, enforce path, uh, asymmetric path. So even for the data, not, not much novelty here. So <coughs> again, we do a lookup in the pit in order to find out if there is a pending interest for a data that we receive. If there isn't, we drop. If there is a, a, an interest, then we'll, we will have to send the data uh, to each of the interfaces that we have in the, in the pit entry, right? And even in this case, we, do we need to do another rewrite. In this case, the rewrite will be on the destination address. That's the one that we're going to use for routing forwarding the data to the next hope, and that is going to be the source address that was written in the previous interest that we received, right? Again, to enforce path symmetry uh, between HIC and hosts. So the last piece, which is we receive a data packet or an interest packet, we are on a router, then how do we know uh, where how to process that is going to be a regular IP packet is an HACN packet and how do we send to the different module here we exploit a well known technique in, uh, in networking which is called punting basically we have a table of rules uh, that matches with the packet and uh, those rules express the prefixes that belong to the HACN real okay so every time a packet matches with one of those rules it will be forward or send up to the HICN function implemented in the router, and then it will follow uh, the, the path, the um, pipeline that I just described to you. So the last piece is about application. So, so far we have uh, naming, so a way or a general way of mapping HICN data and interest into IPv, IP packet. We have routers that are able to do the ICN or HICN processing we are missing the end host, basically. So how do we help developer of using HACN without uh, asking them to rewrite completely their application? So we developed some transform services as we have nowadays in IP, right? We have TCP and UDP and uh, application use socket to send uh, whatever data you need uh, using TCP or UDP. So in this case, we developed two different services. Uh, producer one and a consumer one, which of course they they will provide different uh, feature. So a producer one, usually what it does, it, it needs to perform all the segmentation of a data. So split a big application data into some smaller chunk that are able to fit into an IP packet and perform the authentication and the, and the integrity as the regular ICN requires and do the naming, right? The consumer socket will help the application to retrieve the data, so fetch data, reassembly the, the, the original application data unit and pass it to the, to the application only after uh, it has verified that the packet is, uh, is the original one and the signature hold. 
So here is an example. So let's assume that we have an application as that is using the producer socket. So it has some application data unit that it passes to the producer socket in order to, to get this data available in the network. So the producer socket will do the segmentation, right? So split into smaller chunk that fit into an IT packet. It will perform the integrity and the, and the authentication as uh, required in ICN. And then it will make this data available. So ready to be fetched from whoever that is sending an interest. So let's assume that a consumer socket, so an application running on top of a consumer socket requires some data. There will, there will be an interest going from the consumer side to the producer side, and so the data will be fetched and will be transferred to the consumer socket, which will perform all the signature and the integrity verification. It will do the reassembly, so recreating the original application data unit and pass it to the application. So how do we uh, reduce the pain that application will have of moving from IP to, H to HACN? We designed a NINET-like API socket, so similar to what you have nowadays using uh, TCP or IP, which means that we, we, we developed and we are developing both datagram and stream support and reliable and unreliable. And uh, so far we, uh, we have uh, implemented, so let's say, the HTTP and the RTP support so we are supporting these two application level protocols, and but we are working also on other. So to conclude, with uh, HACN, we tried to solve, and we, are s and we believe we are solving, the major problem of deploying ICN in the current internet. And uh, HACN brings a reduced time to, to go out to the market, as well as there's no trade-off in terms of HACN feature, ICN feature that HACN uh, is using. And uh, as I told you many times, we already developed uh, this thing, so we have a prototype that's available in Cisco. Thank you. outside the room. Uh.